Cars are getting uglier. The BMW XM, the BMW iX, the BMW M3, the BMW M4, the BMW X7, and the BMW 2 Series are fine examples of how bad car design is at the moment. All jokes aside, BMW aren't the only culprits. Look at the last generation of the Civic Type R. It seems needlessly overdesigned and overcomplicated. And don't even get me started on the Nissan Juke. There has to be a reason for it though. Um, am I wrong? Are we all wrong? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, apparently. Cars like the Jaguar E-Type and the Lamborghini Miura are considered by many to be two of the most beautiful cars ever built. Whereas stuff like the PT Cruiser and the Fiat Multipla are resigned to a lifetime of brown paper bags and shame. The multiplayer is kind of so bad it's good, I don't know. But both Chrysler and Fiat probably thought they were designing something innovative and appealing. But unfortunately, just because your grandma calls you a handsome boy doesn't mean you are. However, that got me thinking, what actually makes a car ugly? Yes, it comes down to taste, but there must be specific design elements that make us decide something is good looking or bad looking. Now look, I know how to draw a car, but I'm definitely no car designer. So we thought we'd speak to someone a bit more qualified and with a lot more experience in this field. First of all, I'd like to say what I consider to be beautiful. Beautiful in product design, transportation design, mobility design has to do, I would say 99.9% .9 with proportions followed by a 0.1% of a mixture of different things. For example, flowing lines that make sense, surfacing that we would call entertaining, not bland, not boring. Frank Stevenson's CV includes a long list of incredible car designs, including the Escort Cosworth, the original BMW X5, the Maserati MC12, the Ferrari F430, the McLaren 720S, the P1, loads of others. And all of these cars are what I would consider to be great looking. I mean, the P1, that's my favorite. The proportions of that. Sometimes it's easy to look at something and think it's ugly without really knowing why you feel that way. Unless of course you're looking at the BMW XM, which is better off looked at after a few beers and from a very, very long way away. There are huge problems with the proportions of this vehicle. It has an extremely short front overhang. In other words, the distance between the front axle to the front of the car as opposed to the rear axle to the rear of the car. It looks very, very unbalanced, almost bottom heavy or rear heavy. Uh, not a good thing when you're designing a moving object that needs to look almost like it's tugging at the leash, much more dynamic. Moving products should look like they're moving and not static. The second problem I see with it, it's a very, incohesive design. It almost gives me the feeling that many, many designers were working on this one product. Uh, none of them were very friendly with each other or very talkative to each other. And there was probably a type of miscommunication between what was going on in different areas of the car so that not a lot of the car lines up with the rest of the car. It's a bit of a, uh, a mishmash of different design themes, different angles. I wouldn't call it ugly, but I would call it bizarre grotesqueness, whatever you want to call that, because of the exaggerated features on this, on this car, on this design. See, it's not just me. A few years ago, BMW updated the 7 Series with a set of colossal kidney grills, which resulted in people poking a bit of fun at the luxury scene's big snorters. There were endless memes predicting how far the grill size increase will go, and surely there must have been a good reason behind the decision, right? Adrian Van Hoydonk, BMW's design chief, claimed there are a few reasons for the drastic change. One being that there was some criticism that the entire BMW range looked a bit samey. They wanted to clearly set the luxury 7 series apart from the smaller 5 series. And that is understandable, but why go crazy on the grills? It wasn't necessary on the previous models, so I don't really see why it was here. Then the other reason they cited was China. It's the biggest market for the 7 Series, and whether you like it or not, the customer usually has the final say. It's a bit like the sad state of manual gearboxes now. Yes, many of us hardcore car lovers would prefer it, but if people aren't actually buying it, then there isn't much reason to offer it as an option. Van Hoydonk claimed that European customers prefer subtlety and to fly under the radar. They don't want to be noticed or asked what their car is worth. Whereas it's different in other places in the world where a car is used as more of a status symbol. If you look at the Rolls-Royce's huge Pantheon-inspired front grille, it's a bold piece of design that is now a real statement of wealth and success across the globe. Both Audi and Mercedes have had hefty front grilles for some time, and BMW wanted a slice of that action. And when we say that money talks, let me show you what I mean. The Chinese car market has grown an astonishing amount in recent years. In 2010, BMW sold just 62,000 cars, but by 2020, that number was up over 
over 600,000. And the story is the same with both Audi and Mercedes, which showed similar numbers in the same year. And to put that all into perspective, it's around double the figures that BMW, Audi, and Mercedes sold in the US. Given those numbers, it's easy to see why the car makers want to appeal to the Chinese market. However, where this all falls down is that that isn't an excuse for the BMW M3 and M4's controversial grille design, which if you look at those models, China makes up less than 6% of their sales. The reason for that Angry Birds pig front end was actually performance related. The radiator had to be pushed all the way up to the front in order to improve cooling, something Donut Media made a great video about you should watch. Fortunately, some companies in the aftermarket have been working on ways to improve the look of the front end so you can swap it out if you like. And clearly that shows the demand for it. As with any type of styling, whether it's cars, fashion, or even tech, there will always be trends. For example, the 80s is famed for big hair, bigger phones, neon colors, and boxy car design. And by the time the 2000s rolled around, the cars were slicker and rounder. Taste change changes and designs become dated. Having a mullet might have been cool in 1986, but if you've got one now, you might get some funny looks. And the other thing about trends is that they seem to work in cycles, which brings us on to the sticky subject of nostalgia. Let's throw things back to 2004. You're still a kid, you've got home from school and you load up the PS2. You whack in Need for Speed Underground 2 in the disc drive and life is pretty damn good. That was like one of the greatest games. You should have, should have seen my course on there. It was like underglow, body kit, pink, like candy paint, big wing. On any, anyway, it was good. Now, if you're an adult with responsibilities and stuff, if you load up that same game and let the memories hit you, you'll be happy for a bit, but eventually that'll fade as you come to the realization that it's almost 20 years old and it certainly feels like it. And I know it's painful, but it's true. And we do exactly the same thing with cars. For example, we look back in awe at 80s car design because of stuff like the Testarossa and the Countach, but forget abominations like the Ferrari Mondial and the Aston Martin Lagonda. Not only do trends change styling, but technology does too, electric cars are having a huge effect on car design. At the moment, electric cars are still somewhat like normal cars to us. They just have silly names and a green and blue trim everywhere. Why do they do that? Losing the combustion engine means that there are a variety of styling cues that just aren't necessary anymore. And if they are there, it's so that we don't recoil in horror when the car's revealed. Tesla's Model S originally had a big fake front grille to make it resemble a regular saloon, but modern versions have done away with it altogether because it's just not necessary. Unfortunately though, it seems like some manufacturers, BMW, are disregarding their whole design language altogether, making each model look completely different from the next in, in a really weird way. So we've heard from an expert in Frank Stevenson about how these cars are being designed ugly. So there is a reason behind our madness when we see these monstrosities revealed. However, it is worth noting that not all new cars are pig ugly monsters. There are still some good examples of quality car design. The new Mercedes SL is really good looking and the current Alfa Giulia, that's a another level. Then you've got more extreme designs like the Aston Martin Valkyrie, which looks unlike any road-going hypercar we've seen before. So maybe there's still hope yet. Some designs age like fine wine and some really don't. If you look at the Chris Bangle era of BMWs, the 5 Series and the 6 Series, they were ridiculed over 15 years ago, but are now considered to be quite iconic designs. So with this new craze, are we just behind the times? Probably when people say we're we don't get it or uh, we're, we're old fashioned or we're not with the times or we're not moving forward. I don't agree. Beauty is eternal. Ugly is ugly. That's just the way it is and beauty lasts forever. Again, this stuff is all quite subjective and what I think looks great, you might think looks awful. Unless of course we're talking about the BMW XM, which nobody likes. Thank you so much to Frank Stevenson for coming on the show. You should really check out his channel. It's awesome. Thank you very much for watching. You should check out this other video about BMW's color changing car and we'll catch you in the next one.